Not yet. Oh, there you go. Retourne. Hmm. Okay. There we go. Good. Perfect. Well, hello everybody and thank you very much for joining us today. We are live from ISDAS in Nara in Japan. I am Elsa Kureri, uh, so for the corporate marketing for Septodon Company. And I'm very, very happy today to be able to interview Professor Stanley Malamed uh, here in Nara. So Professor, could you please tell me a little bit about, sure. uh, about yourself before we go into the highlights of the Congress? Great. Hi, so I'm Stanley Malamed. I'm a dentist anesthesiologist. I'm originally from New York City in the United States, and I live and work in California. Uh, I'm a professor of anesthesia at the University of Southern California School of Dentistry, which is located in Los Angeles, California. And we are here in beautiful Nara, Japan, at the uh, 15th IFDAS conference. IFDAS is the International Federation of Dental Anesthesia Societies, and uh, it's in cooperation with the Federation of Asian Dental Anesthesia Societies, and the Japanese Dental Society of Anesthesiology. It's a three-day program, and uh, we are actually now in the third day of the program, so the program is actually finishing up quite shortly. Um, it's been fun, and... Uh, well, then, about this program, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about the goal of this Congress before we go deeper into the content? Sure. Well, the, all these uh, three societies are basically dealing with dental anesthesia, in its broadest sense. So uh, the, the general themes of the conference are discussions of general anesthesia, sedation, whether it's inhalation sedation, which is nitrous oxide and oxygen, or intravenous sedation. Local anesthesia is a big part of the program. And then sort of sub-subjects are the anesthetic management of patients who have uh, special considerations. Uh, one of the big uh, programs here was about the aging population, the geriatric patient, and how they how to manage pain control and fear in the persons who are older, fit patients with physical disabilities, and patients who are medically compromised, the persons with respiratory problems and or cardiovascular problems. And one other area is the management of chronic pain, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, for example. So those are the major subjects, the five subjects that are being highlighted at this program. But thank you very much for, for these uh, highlights. And can you maybe share with us the three uh, main conferences to you, what really raised your attention and the content of those conferences? Right, and there were actually more than three, but there were three that really <coughs> stood out in my mind. Uh, probably for me, the highlight thus far was the, it's called the Young IFDAS Conference, and uh, my being there sort of went against the title of the Young IFDAS Conference, but they were six speakers from different countries who were discussing the status of dental anesthesiology in each of their countries. Uh, we had a speaker from Russia, we had a speaker from Australia, Canada, Japan, Israel, and the United States. Yeah. And I think the, the major thing that we took away from this uh, program is number one, no matter what country you're from, patients are afraid of going to the dentist. Uh, the numbers they gave us were 21% uh, of adults in Australia are phobic. They, they, they need something more than just local anesthesia, whether it's nitrous oxide or IV sedation or general anesthesia. I think the numbers were very close to that, 20 to 30 in, in Israel. 30% uh, of adults need sedation to face the dental treatment. So it's a fear, you know, this is not new. I mean, I've been coming to these meetings now since 1982, and that same problem exists. Uh, some, of the, some of the countries that we talked about, uh, the, the idea of dental anesthesiology is relatively new. And in other countries like Japan, where dental anesthesiology is a recognized specialty. Where 29 dental, there are 29 dental schools in Japan, and each of these dental schools has its own department of dental anesthesiology. Now, I'm from the United States, where we have, I think, about 60 dental schools, and only about three of our dental schools will actually have a dedicated department. So the Japanese are way ahead of us, as far as that's concerned. There are other countries in the world, uh, which shall go unnamed, where a dentist is prohibited from using sedation on patients. So obviously a tremendous variation from country to country. 
There was one, one speaker at the uh, Young, young uh, IFDAS meeting from Russia who talked about a study that she did where they compared the stress of having dentistry done to the patient, and they also measured the stress of doing the dentistry on a scared patient, on the dentist. And they, they found that as much as the patient's blood pressure and heart rate would go up when they're fearful, the dentist who's treating this fearful patient, their blood pressure and heart rate went up also. And when they use sedation on patients, the patient's blood pressure and heart rate went down, as did the dentist. They, they did this with hypnosis, they did it with uh, behavior modification techniques and also with drugs. So bottom line, the takeaway from that one is really simple. If you ignore a patient's fear, okay, it not only affects your patient adversely, but think about how many of these fearful patients that we treat every day, every week, it'll take a toll on the doctor <coughs> over a period of time. So ignoring a patient's fear is something that you don't want to do. Uh, so that was, that was, I mean, to me, as I said, at, at this moment, the, the highlight uh, of, of the meeting. The, the, the second thing that really impressed me was the program on emergency medicine. And the title of the program was 10 Minutes to Save a Life. Now, it was presented by a group of Americans, and the reason for the title is that in the United States, uh, our emergency phone number is, is 911. I know in Europe it's 112. Australia, it's triple zero. But if you were to have a medical emergency and call an emergency ambulance, in the United States, the average time from the phone call being made to the ambulance arriving at the scene is 10 minutes. So we call this course 10 minutes to save a life. The doctor, the dental doctor, would have to be able to keep that person alive uh, for about about 10 minutes. And um, obviously, you know, it, it talks about basic life support, it talks about how to handle the patient having a seizure, uh, how to handle asthmatics, having uh, an acute asthmatic attack. And one of the things that came out of that, which I uh, really, I've been involved to in a little bit uh, in getting this organized, is an app. There's an app for that. And it, it's uh, basically the app is online, it's called 10 Minutes to Save a Life, the Emergency Manual. And it's downloadable onto your smartphone. You can also print it up on a P as a PDF file. But that, again, is something, because especially, especially when you, if you do not recognize a patient's fear and then treat it, okay? Uh, medical emergencies happen, and they're more apt to happen in patients who are fearful. Uh, a very good example, in a survey that I did many, many years ago, the most common medical emergency reported by American dentists, and we had 4,000 dentists who responded to the survey, half of all the emergencies were fainting, okay. syncope. And I mean, most syncope occurs when this macho guy is getting an injection. Well, if you treat a patient's fear, take away the patient's fear, I mean, happy people don't faint. So if you recognize a patient's fear, and if you do something about it, again, using sedation, whether it's with drugs, inhalation sedation, or oral sedation, or IV sedation, or even if you can use hypnosis, or acupuncture, or anything, you're taking away a patient's fear, you're eliminating medical emergencies. Or maybe just communicating better. Communicating, saying, yeah, exactly. You know, again, happy people don't think. Very, very simple, okay? So that, again, the medical emergencies part of this was, was really a good program. There were some hands-on programs on medical emergencies where they talked about maintaining uh, airways on people who were obese, how to do this very simple airway maneuvers, which is a very important component of saving a life. Very good program. And the third program uh, was on local anesthesia. There have been a, a number of programs on local anesthesia here. Let's, let's talk about them. Let's talk about local, <laughs> okay. Um, Articane has been the major thrust. And it's interesting because Articane, uh, I'm from the United States, where Articane was introduced uh, in the year 2000. Right. So it's been 18 years. By Septodont. By Septodont. We have to do a commercial break here. But <laughs> by Septodont. And at that, the brand name, of course, at that time was Septocaine. And from country to country, of course, the, the same drug has different brand names. But it has become, in 
virtually every country in which it's been introduced, either the number one or the number two most used local anesthetic in our profession. It was introduced in Germany in 1972, and uh, Dr. Wolfgang Jaco gave a program uh, on Sunday morning, and uh, I think the numbers he gave were in 2015, 90% of all the local anesthetics used by German dentists is Articate. Uh, we were talking to our Soviet, our Soviet, our, our Russian, <laughs> forgive me, our Russian colleagues, I was going back in history too far, <laughs> our Russian colleagues, and in actual fact, the only local anesthetics available in Russia at this point in time are Articane and Mepivacaine. So it, you know, lidocaine used to be the gold standard, used to be the drug to which we compared all new local anesthetics. It was the best. And in most cases, Articane has become the gold standard. It, it is in many ways a better local anesthetic. Now, that doesn't mean to say that lidocaine or mepivacaine are not good locals. They're excellent locals compared to what came before them which was the procaine, the novocaine type drugs. But when you compare articaine to lidocaine, there are some very definite advantages to that drug. And this meeting brought out a lot of the, uh, the highlights, if you will, of the superiority of articaine. Well, thank you very much, Professor Malamed, for all the, uh, the highlights of the Congress. I hope uh, all oh, dentists one thing. enjoy. Oh, yeah, conclusion. Here, no, not even the conclusion, but they've had a couple of uh, social events at this meeting. And, and we had a, a wonderful uh, reception last night. If ever you have a chance, I don't know where you are, but if you come to Japan, specifically to Nara, do so. It is a beautiful place. Uh, we're sitting here in the middle of a deer park. True. And if you literally walk outside where we are right now, 30 feet, 30, 25 meters away, uh, you're surrounded by deer. Everywhere. It is, it is marvelous. And the Great Buddha. The Great Buddha. It's I think you can, you can talk maybe a little bit about the Great Buddha. <laughs> he's big. He's great. He's a big and he's great Buddha. So again, I want to thank you. This has been a marvelous meeting and I want to thank you for inviting me for this little conference. Thank you very much, Professor Menemet. Thank, thank you all for, for watching. Thank you.